I'm delighted to introduce my colleague and friend, Dr. John Haldane. He's asked me to keep the introduction brief, and so I shall. Professor Haldane is the J. J. Newton Razar Senior Distinguished Professor of Philosophy at Baylor University, Chair of the Royal Institute of Philosophy, London, Fellow of the Royal Society of Edinburgh, Senior Fellow in Philosophy at the University of St. Andrews, and Visiting Professor in the Jubilee Center for Character and Virtue at the University of Birmingham. He holds first degrees in both fine art and in philosophy, and a PhD in philosophy from London University. He has held visiting positions at the universities Edinburgh, Oxford, Pittsburgh, Notre Dame, and at Notre Dame, he is the senior fellow in the Center for Ethics and Culture. He has also held the Roden Davis Chair of Humanities at Georgetown University and delivered Gifford Lectures at Aberdeen. He is a consultant to the Pontifical Council of Culture and a member of the Pontifical Academy of St. Thomas Aquinas and the Pontifical Academy of Life at the Vatican. He is an honorary doctoral graduate of St. Anselm's College, New Hampshire, and of the University of Glasgow, 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 anyway, a place in Scotland. <laughs> it's not Latin, but I still have trouble with it. <laughs> and earlier this year, he was awarded an honorary doctorate from Notre Dame, Australia, and in September, he was named by Best Schools Magazine as one of the 50 most influential living philosophers. A substantial honor indeed. On a more personal note, as I began to anticipate the arrival of John and his wonderful wife, Hilda, to Central Texas in August, I became a bit nervous. How would these two Scots take to Central Texas, especially arriving in mid-August. Just fine, it seems. Since arriving in Waco, Texas, they've bought two bicycles and a car. Since John can't drive, he often bikes to school and back, or to the farmer's market on university parks, or to the flea market on La Salle on Saturday morning, where he meets Hilda. A car is necessary, of course, for the trip to the flea market, just to, just to decorate his office or their flat, John Barry buys various knickknacks, trinkets, glassware that others of us, having sense, have thrown away. <laughs> On some weekends, John and Hilda enjoy the Texas countryside, taking side trips to San Antonio, Fort Worth, Glen Rose or Walnut Springs. When Glen Rose or Walnut Springs is their destination, more often than not, to Hilda's dismay, they go visit what else but more junk stores to buy more glassware and knickknacks than any sane person throws away. <laughs> Recently, they drove to Santa Fe and back, stopping in Lubbock to deliver lectures at Texas Tech John says, but I suspect John went to pay homage to that great Texas singer, Buddy Holly. So I've decided that John and Hilda are settling in just fine, especially since they now are Texas cultured enough to enjoy Texas barbecue and are willing to eat that fine cuisine not only in Waco, but to drive to Hammond's Barbecue in Glen Rose to compare its offerings to what's available here. Where's Dan Dennis Sansom? Okay, he's not here. Well, I'm glad because Dennis might be persuading him that the barbecue place called Salt Lick in Dripping Springs, Texas, has better barbecue than here in Waco. And I really don't want Hilda dragged off to drip, Dripping Springs for more barbecue. But on the other hand, once Yankees, 
and their ilk, but began to drive here, there, and yon in search of the best barbecue in Texas? Well, we've got them in Waco, I hope, for a long time. Please welcome Professor John Haldane, Baylor's newest Texas, to our podium, Texan. First thing I need to do is um, uh, introduce Mike to the difference between trinkets and collectibles. Uh, <laughs> but uh, that's what philosophers call an essentially contested concept. So we'll, uh, we'll leave that perhaps to another occasion. Um, I want to begin, if I may, really by uh, saying a word or two uh, on my own behalf, but more generally uh, to Darren. Um, I think that this occasion and previous occasions, I've spoken on, on one previously um, in 2011, and the proceedings of that are, or sorry, a set of essays deriving from that are uh, shortly to be published. On that occasion, I think the general theme was wisdom. But um, that wasn't my uh, first visit to Baylor, but it was one that sort of fixed in my mind uh, in a way that a previous uh, fleeting visit had not done something of the character and identity of Baylor University. Um, two words that are often on Darren's lips are gracious and winsome. And uh, it seems to me these apply to him preeminently. Um, he conducts himself with real grace. Uh, he secures uh, the interest, affection of others with winsomeness, and he has great charity. Um, and I think that these, in the conception, he has rightly uh, given acknowledgement to those who played a very important role in enabling him to see through, the, through, see through this series. But in conceiving them, in planning them, I was going to say in executing them, perhaps I'll say in implementing them, uh, he really does a wonderful job. And so I think we should begin just by thanking Darren very much indeed. <laughs> With regards to Beatty, all I can say is that we made a pact uh, a few years ago to write one another's obituaries in an effort <laughs> to ensure that nobody else would get a chance to tell the truth. And um, <laughs> I was, I was going to say I think I've just heard mine, but actually I think I might want to have a word with him about this, because this pact could be off. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so um, the uh, theme that I have taken for this is... Um, learning from tradition a source of meaning and of truth. And I think the idea is that by this point in the conference, many of you will have made presentations of your own, you'll listen to presentations from others and so on. You're preparing to depart off back to um, other places or those of your local. This is all coming to a close now. And I suppose that part of the function uh, of a speaker at this stage in proceedings is at least in part to entertain as well as perhaps to... Um, uh, to inform. So I will try, I'm not in a, it's not going to be in a riotous way, I can tell you, but I, I will try um, to, um, uh, to, to provide some entertainment. Um, I say not in a riotous way because I'm still not sufficiently acclimatized to the environment of a Baptist university to know quite uh, where the limits, uh, <laughs> where the limits lie. Um, I uh, have had the good fortune throughout my life um, to live uh, at least part of the year, and some some stages in my life, the whole of the year, uh, year round, uh, by the sea. And when I was saying to somebody I was coming to Baylor, they said, "Do you know that it's dry?" And I said, "Well, of course. I mean, it's it's fairly far inland." But uh, <laughs> as it turned out, um, anyway. <laughs> so, on that happy note, um, now. You've already uh, been the beneficiaries of two very interesting uh, plenaries. And, um, I mean, recall the opening one, uh, James Hunter's Challenges and Opportunities for Christian Higher Education in the 21st Century, and Candace Vogler's um, of Yesterday, Higher Education in a Wider Context. Now, the first of those was a historical uh, socio-cultural review and analysis leading to, as it were, an evangelical call to address an intellectual and leadership vacuum in American higher education. The second, Candace 
Candace's, was in a way a psychological come existential review uh, and analysis of different sets of people and their contrasting lives and experiences, again leading to a call to educate towards an authentically meaningful form of life, inspired by a Christian understanding of human dignity and destiny. What I have to say this evening will, I think, bear more of a relation to the first, um, to James Hunter's uh, address, uh, perhaps than to Candace's, though like Candace, uh, I approach these issues from a philosophical as well as from a Christian uh, perspective. Now, um, what I'm going to do at this point, uh, and hope that I don't pull the wiring out, uh, is lift this up in order that I can manage the, uh, the manage the PowerPoint. Right. Um, I should say that about at about ten to six, I was struggling to get this onto um, a USB stick, and uh, it was resisting all efforts. So I, I thought, hmm, I'm not quite sure how this is going to go. I'm not sure that it, how this is going to go, because we'll, <laughs> we'll have to see whether indeed this has. So let me just make sure that I... Yeah, okay. So um, let me begin by reminding you of things that were said uh, at the opening of all of this. First of all, by Greg Jones, the um, uh, vice, executive vice president provost uh, here at Baylor. And uh, he spoke of a time of challenge and of stress. He mentioned, among other things, the rising costs of higher education, the challenges those pose to would-be students, to their families, and so on, and indeed to institutions. The curriculum disputes, it's a familiar feature. Um, social unrest and conflict on campuses, and the diversity of constituencies and expectations that those in higher education uh, have to try to address and to satisfy. And then uh, James Hunter, in his plenary, uh, talked about challenges to the coherence of secular higher education. Uh, he said of it that it was, in one way, and, and in an obvious way, a carrier of the assumptions of the Enlightenment, uh, but in a less obvious way, a bearer of the legacy of Christian understanding. Uh, he also observed, and rightly so, that it's challenged by fragmentations of three kinds, broadly speaking, under three general headings. One of languages, uh, language and concepts. One of ideals of knowledge and of the value of knowledge. And then again, uh, a series of uh, challenges uh, represented by fragmentation around the idea of moral purposes. Now, as I listened to him speak, uh, I was reminded of, of a previous uh, occasion, and I was trying to think uh, what it was. Um, and it was an occasion uh, of an essay um, uh, of my own, as it happens, in which I was, in about 1997 here, contributing to a volume uh, entitled The End of Knowledge in Higher Education. And this, um, uh, this, this pair of images we have here actually show the covers of two books, one published in 1997, that collection, The End of Knowledge in Higher Education, and the other uh, published um, last year, University's Reputation. And I've headed this uh, from Marx to market management. Uh, because what's interesting to me, or, and I, I hope to others of you, is the way in which uh, over the past 20 years, there has in fact been a shift in higher education, particularly in universities, that's to say uh, higher education institutions particularly with graduate and especially PhD programs, from um, very sort of public and prominent debates around the notion of the canon, um, the uh, idea of the ends and roles and aims and so on of education, um, through to a current concern, a preoccupation, uh, very much with universities' reputations. And um, a whole new class of university managers has sort of grown up who really don't have, often, uh, don't have much uh, background in education as such. Sometimes they come from other sectors. But they've been brought into universities to try to uh, promote uh, those, those institutions as businesses of one kind or another. Uh, and even where they're not formally speaking businesses, the conception of them as, as that kind of institution. So these two uh, collections of essays, 
uh, separated by 20 years, although they're very, very different, I think they each tell us something about the state of uh, higher education, and not only, by the way, in the United States. In fact, the, the volume uh, whose cover you're seeing on the left there was one that was commissioned um, by uh, senior academics at uh, the University of London Institute of Education, which is a, an important international center for uh, research in education. But you can see the kind of issues that it had in mind, the end of knowledge in higher education. And it was sort of trying to engage certain um, radical challenges to notions of knowledge, challenges coming from a whole variety of fields, from social anthropology that was very concerned with challenging the kind of legacy of imperialism, um, notions of, uh, of, of knowledge itself, uh, diagnoses of knowledge through power, in terms of power structures, Freudian, Marxist, Nietzschean, and so on analyses. And that sort of thing was very much um, in vogue. I mean, it had been in vogue for some while, but it, it, uh, in the various subject areas, in cultural studies, in modern languages, and social anthropology, and so on. But by that point, in the mid, uh, towards the, from the mid uh, towards the end of the 1990s, I think um, educationalists themselves were beginning to think that they need to try to, in some sort of systematic way, take account of some of these uh, challenges that were coming from uh, from different uh, subject areas. And um, the, the, uh, the text on the right is uh, the proceedings or a selection of essays from a rather interesting conference that was held in Spain uh, last year um, at which uh, representatives of the world ranking, college and university ranking uh, organizations uh, were present. And it was um, striking to me that the University of Oxford now has a sort of deputy vice chancellor for reputation. Uh, Harvard has a senior uh, manager for reputation and so on. So even these elite institutions you would think to be sort of invulnerable to these pressures are very concerned uh, with reputational questions. Um, one of the major uh, sort of ranking uh, bodies um, has been the, the Times Higher Education Supplement, Times Higher, which produces this ranking of world universities. But the, one of the things that emerged at this, this was the first of what is to be a series, an annual conference on universities' reputations, was the way in which the whole thing is moving eastwards. Um, there's a Shanghai ranking, uh, which is going to be much more important than the uh, London or uh, Berlin or New York-based rankings, uh, as higher education globalizes in various ways. Anyway, the, um, if I just... Yeah, so the end of knowledge in higher education, this, um, uh, this volume, as I say, there is the uh, London University Institute of Education. You can either regard that as the stairway to heaven or the descent to hell. I'm not quite sure which, but <laughs> I, I leave that to, to you. As it sort of stuck on to a bit of um, sort of classic British brutalism, it's probably the descent to hell. Um, now, um, in, that, uh, in that volume, uh, my own essay was titled, um, The Challenge, Education After Ideology, Whose Crisis, What Knowledge? And of course, you will recognize in that stylistic form, Whose Crisis, What Knowledge, a reference to a form of words made famous by uh, Alastair McIntyre. Um, not those words, but that form. Whose justice, which rationality? But um, I sketch as a background four elements, which I think in some ways correspond to the things that um, were the subject James Hunter's presentation uh, on uh, the first night. And uh, one of these was the idea of the end of meta-narratives, the idea that we're beyond an era in which it's at all plausible to give explanatory histories of what I'll call a, a generally vindicatory kind. I'm going to come back to the notion of a vindicatory history later on. But, I mean, the, the model for a certain kind of uh, meta-narrative is, in a way, sacred scripture. Um, Augustine, very beautifully, for example, um, deploys the notion of sacred scripture and the narrative of sacred scripture to find a, a parallelism between uh, the experiences in the lives of individuals and the uh, experience, the historical experience of the people of Israel, um, in the first covenant and the second covenant, and so on. And so that sense of creation, uh, fall, redemption, covenant, recovenant, reach, and so on is played out very interestingly in Augustine's mind as, as having a parallelism between 
what we experience in our own lives and what sacred history provides uh, as a larger narrative for human life in general. Now, that notion of, of sacred history is transposed into a secular idiom, famously uh, by Hegel uh, in his writings on the philosophy of history. And those were, of course, influential upon Marx. But another set of people upon whom they were influential were uh, historians, in particular cultural historians. And it became uh, very familiar in the 20th century, for example, as many German scholars uh, escaped, made their way, uh, say, to Britain, to the United States, and so on, to write books called things like The Story Of. So some of you remember Gombrich's The Story of Art, and so on. This was this kind of narrative structure of human culture and human civilization. Well, part of what I take it uh, was being rejected um, uh, in the period of the, from the 60s onwards and so on, was the uh, very idea of that kind of history. A second um, element that's been rejected is any notion of transcendence, either religious transcendence or even rational transcendence, the idea that there is this perspective of reason that, as it were, transcends difference and which is authoritative uh, for us or, or over us. And then again, I think something less uh, familiar but the abandonment of humanism. I mean, it's a very striking fact that the, the, uh, the legacy of Marx, of Freud, and of Nietzsche it should be a rejection of humanism. And when I say humanism, I don't mean in the sense of sort of secular atheism. I mean the idea of a kind of an ennobling conception of human beings as a kind. Um, that was represented in various ways. I mean, even setting aside the religious representations of it, but in one way or another, the idea of humans as universally a locus of value. And then finally, the idea of the instrumentalization of reason, that reason can only uh, have any role uh, to the extent that it has any at all is in managing preferences. Now, um, a, a, a figure who was influential uh, in the American Academy in advancing some of those radical ideas, rejecting those various elements, sorry, rejecting these, the idea of meta-narratives, transcendence, humanism, and reason, um, was Richard Rorty. And it's worth, I think, just quoting uh, briefly here from one of his last uh, public lectures, um, a lecture given in Italy. Uh, public lectures are generally designed to try to influence the culture, to influence people's thinking, and so on. So these are, this is him taking his ideas, as he had done for some years prior to that, to a wider constituency, to society more generally. And um, this was published posthumously, uh, but he, um, in it he says this, is the church right that there's such a thing as the structure of human existence, which can serve as a moral reference point, or do we human beings have no moral obligations except helping one another satisfy our desires, thus achieving the greatest possible amount of happiness. There's nothing already in existence to which our moral ideals should try to correspond. The answer to the question, are some human desires bad, is no, but some desires do get in the way of our project of maximizing the overall satisfaction of desire. There is no such thing as an intrinsically evil desire. Now, it seems to me this is a very remarkable testament, as it were, virtually a closing testament. At that point, he was aware of the fact that he was already dying. And um, I think it sort of represents, for some people, of course, what it will represent is a reductio ad absurdum on the whole of the set of assumptions that led to that. But that's where uh, Rorty's own rejection of the idea of meta-narratives, of transcendence, of humanism, and of reason uh, brought him to. There is no such thing as an intrinsically evil desire. Now, um, how might one respond to all of this? Well, um, I'm calling here education in a time of scholera. Uh, <laughs> definition, an, an acute infection caused by ingestion of contaminated ideas which poses a global threat to intellectual health. That is what scholera is. Um, now, it seems to me that there, it seemed to me in 1997, and... Um, I'm going to make some slight progress on what I said then. It seems to me in, 19, it seemed to me in 1997 that one could identify four possible responses to these challenges. One was what I called romantic affirmation. And that's, as it were, going on as before, but now in a spirit of nostalgia. So the response to the, uh, 
the criticisms of the radicals and so on is in a sense just to try to ignore them, to go on before, um, and to be romantically attached to the sense of the past. Um, going on, as I say, going on as before in a spirit of nostalgia. Um, and, and that has had its manifestations. Uh, it's had its manifestation in some of the smaller uh, independent uh, Christian colleges that have come into existence uh, over the last two or three decades. Not in all of them, but in some. I think it's, um, it's something that features in the minds of some students who are attracted to those. It features in some uh, courses, uh, some texts, and so on. It's basically a kind of turning uh, one's back uh, on the current world and trying to as it were, reaffirm uh, the past, but often, I think, in a spirit of nostalgia. A second possibility is endless irony. And this, in a way, quotes the forms of the past, but, but the substance has been hollowed out. One simply doesn't believe what one says, but one just quotes it. Uh, it continues to provide the forms of education, the forms of scholarship, and so on. But it's done with a kind of distance, as if the whole thing was done uh, in quotations. You know, don't let anybody believe that, that I'm actually um, signed up to these things. I'm mentioning them uh, rather than using them. And then a third possible response to all of this is pragmatism, uh, which is, again, a kind of managing of preferences. Um, that's what, in a sense, that's, I mean, Rorty saw himself in the American pragmatist tradition. And um, that's a very common response uh, in higher education, to just to try to sort of hold the thing together as best you can, trying to maximize the satisfaction uh, of the preferences of the various constituencies. And then the fourth possibility is uh, one of reform and um, renewal, which turns out here to involve recovering the tration. Yes, I'm not sure quite sure. Yeah. If you don't know what a tration is, that just shows how ill-educated you all are. Yeah. <laughs> tra tra trations are a bit like traditions, <laughs> but they are importantly different. <laughs> And I'll leave it you, to you to try to work out what that difference might be. So <laughs> since I suspect that's a subtlety that may be lost, I'm just going to henceforth speak about traditions. And tra <laughs> tra traditions will have to be the subject of another talk. It, it, it will, of course, be a very selective uh, research uh, seminar. <laughs> um, but uh, we'll see if we can let you in. Right, anyway, recovering the traditions. Um, it really is traditions, all right? Now, uh, so let me now talk about traditions. And um, first of all, I want to talk about uh, traditions in a familiar sense of that, the, the way in which colleges and universities are attached, and not only those, but other institutions, are attached to their traditions. So here are some Baylor University traditions. The Baylor line, we'll march forever down the years as long as stars so shall shine. We'll fling our green and gold afar to light the ways of time and guide us as we onward go that good old Baylor line. Another aspect of Baylor traditions, memorial lampposts, the university seal for church for Texas, family weekend, class book, academic regalia, ceremonies with gowns, etc. And this is a quotation, ceremonies with gowns, etc. and maces are colorful traditions handed down from European universities of the Middle Ages. Now all colleges and universities have these kinds of traditions. I mean, they vary somewhat from one place to another and so on, but I think they are an important um, aspect of the sense of identity. They're part of what draw people into them, they're part of what sustain people while they are in them, and they're part of what people take away and help maintain their affection, their sense of identity, their sense of common membership. Um, this is a characteristic, um, sort of emblematic representation of that. This uh, Baylor ring incorporates many uh, elements of different uh, aspects of um, the campus that people would be familiar with uh, and symbolic representation and so on. You can see there the Baylor seal, uh, the bell tower, the statue of Judge Baylor, memorial lampposts and so on, all represented uh, on those uh, rings. And then another, um, which I've not yet actually seen and I'm not quite sure where it's kept, but I'll be interested to see it, is the Baylor uh, Mace. Now, it was said a moment ago uh, in the note at the bottom that ceremonies with gowns, etc., and maces are colorful traditions handed down from European universities of the Middle Ages. So 
Let me just shift uh, briefly from the uh, Baylor traditions, which I'm learning about, um, to the traditions uh, of the University of St. Andrews, which I know uh, somewhat better, having inhabited it for um, a large part of my life. So these are some of our maces. The three on the right, the, 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 the gilded ones, are all um, 15th century maces. The one on the left is uh, of, of St. Andrews, a 20th century mace. And one question uh, that I want to pose uh, about this, not about these maces in particular, but maces in general, is to the extent to which they continue to serve as staffs and the extent to which they are now being used as skewers. Um, and what I mean by that, the ways in which universities themselves no longer perhaps, universities and colleges, no longer represent uh, through their maces, which were of course symbols of office, uh, of authority, and so on. These are the ones on the right, there are maces of colleges or the faculty of canon law, the faculty of arts, and so on. So they're representations of a kind of intellectual authority, both within an institution and more broadly within the culture. But in many ways, universities have used the authority represented by their maces not so much to inform and guide the culture, but to skewer the culture. And so I think there is a question about that. Now, let me just, um, I did promise you some slight bit of entertainment. Let me just show you one or two other traditions. I've seen the Baylor traditions. Uh, here's a St. Andrew's tradition where the students uh, wear red gowns. They're going out on a medieval pier. Uh, here's a tradition, tradition of heraldic displays. I thought you'd like this one because you can see um, the future king and his wife seated there in the quadrangle. Um, we also have uh, traditions of martyrs and miracles. Um, this is the first recorded Protestant miracle. You'll be interested uh, to know that. If you look at the upper uh, image here, this is a college tower, the Tower of St. Salvator College. Um, I think there's a little white square, yeah. Uh, Patrick Hamilton, whose initials can be seen um, set out in cobbles on the ground there, which is below, just below the tower. Patrick Hamilton was put to death there, the first Protestant martyr um, in Scotland. And as his body burned, so his image appeared on the tower. Now, what I like about this, uh, coming from a tradition in which martyrs and miracles are rather familiar to me, uh, I do enjoy the irony of the fact that one of the things that the Scottish Reformation was to, supposed to do was purge religion of superstition and miracles. <laughs> and the first martyr's death was marked by the miraculous appearance of his face on the tower. So these, these things, it can be harder to get these things out of the bloodstream than you, than you really know. Um, here are some dignified rituals. This is the Sunday pier walk. Uh, people walk out on the lower half, and you can see there's an upper half. It's a sort of stepped... Um, here. Um, walking back on the higher <laughs> path with those gowns is a slightly dangerous business because the wind can catch you. But those are dignified rituals, and here are some undignified rituals. Um, <laughs> other rituals are graduation rituals. Now, I'm going to show you this, and the next time you will see it will almost certainly be on Fox uh, TV, or possibly MSNBC, depending who offers me the higher price. You're wondering what that could possibly be. Uh, it's this. Um, this is the University of St. Andrews, and you'll see grouped in the middle there um, somebody who may, within 11 days, be the President of the United States. And uh, I offer this as a caption uh, competition. <laughs> <laughs> and. Uh, it's a pity we don't have white paper napkins, because I'd invite you at this point to just jot down your suggestions. Uh, I have a dream is a possibility. Uh, <laughs> I see emails, emails everywhere. <laughs> There's a tall, not dark, not very handsome man <laughs> going to feature him uh, as a challenge in my life uh, somehow <laughs> later on and so on. Uh, but you'll see that... Um, so engaging and riveting uh, is what she has to say that the vice chancellor of the university, the lady uh, to her right, who's since become the vice chancellor of Oxford University, isn't quite getting the point. But anyway, a, there, is, <laughs> there is something happening there. As I say, I'm not quite sure whether to sell that to the 
to the Trump campaign or to try to or get money out of the, the Clinton campaign by saying I won't make it uh, available, right? Okay, so back from Marx to uh, market management. So this later conference that I was mentioning, um, the one entitled University Reputation, was held, um, as I say, in Spain uh, last year. And uh, these are the proceedings, or the, at least a selection of the talks that were, were given to that. So let me just quote the titles for you, because I think you might find this interesting. So the, the, I should say that, I mean, the, the, the circumstance of all of this is the tremendous competition now that there is in higher education, in colleges and universities, to secure students, to secure funding. Uh, many um, universities from the United States, in Great Britain, are opening up campuses in other parts of the world, in Singapore, in the Middle East, and so on. Um, but uh, other uh, colleges and universities are, are um, making inroads into the... Um, relatively privileged position that English-speaking institutions used to enjoy. Anyway, so the new thing in higher education studies is university reputations. And uh, let me just uh, uh, quote the titles of the uh, pieces in this. Reputation, quality, and success in education. Corporate reputation considering the reputation of the world's leading universities, strategic management of university reputation, how international PhD students choose top universities and interpret reputation and rankings, cultivating reputation with the aid of communication. Now, my own contribution to this, I've not given you the title of it yet, but this is the title of my contribution, Students at the Heart of the University Education Enterprise. <laughs> so, you can see that in the context of this event, this was a somewhat eccentric contribution. <laughs> no, no mention of reputation. Uh, though, as I did actually, uh, in the course of that, make the point that actually one of the most um, secure ways of securing reputation, I mean, not seeking it as an end, but it's a typical byproduct, is by offering first class uh, undergraduate education. And that is one thing that I think in particular the United States uh, excels at. Um, and uh, I would single out, especially in that, the liberal arts colleges. Uh, I think that you, some of the best education you can get in the English-speaking world now, and has been so for some time, would be in um, American liberal arts colleges. Um, research universities pay less and less attention uh, to uh, undergraduate education. But I'm happy to say that Baylor strikes a very happy um, and successful, I think, balance between education, undergraduate education, uh, graduate uh, formation, uh, scholarship, uh, and research. Now, um, I want now to return, return to tradition, not to traditions, but to the idea of tradition, and say something uh, briefly about that. Um, so let's begin by trying to define tradition. So I'm not talking about traditions in the sense in which we saw those earlier, but tradition, what tradition is. So I think there are probably four um, definitions that are relevant here. I mean, they're related in various ways, but, and some are more familiar than others. But one sense of tradition is that of custom. And so in Richard II, we have throw away respect, tradition, form, and ceremony as duty. Set aside custom, as it were. Uh, another uh, use of the term tradition um, is here I extract this from Francis Bacon, The Advancement of Learning. The expressing or transferring our knowledge to others, I will term by the general name of tradition or delivery. Interesting that he introduces it for that purpose. Um, teaching. When two rabbis, says their Talmud, maintain contrary opinions, yet must not men contradict them because both of them has his Kabbalah or tradition for the same. So here a tradition is, as it were, a body of teaching. And then, uh, finally, the idea of tradition as a source, traditio, a kind of delivering or handing on or handing down a saying, an instruction, a practice or a teaching. Now, I think... All of these notions of tradition are relevant, but it's really the last of them that I want to um, 
pick up for these purposes. Um, I spoke earlier on about reform and renewal, and now I'm speaking about the role of tradition effectively in trying to uh, produce reform and renewal. So it's this notion of um, tradition as a delivering or a handing on or a handing down, a saying, an instruction, a practice, or a teaching. And a practice will turn out to be uh, rather important in this. Now, there are different approaches to understanding tradition or traditions. The anthropological approach, obviously, so that looks for structural features of social intergenerational relationships and then is interested in the vehicles of those relationships and also the content of them. Um, so, you know, anthropologists might be interested in kingship and the way in which the notion of kingship is, is transmitted within a given uh, social group. Then there's a historical, cultural uh, mode of understanding uh, the idea of tradition understanding tradition as embodiments of practices and purposes that have both internal and external goods. I said by internal goods, I mean goods that are internal to the practice itself and external goods, goods may, that may be delivered by the practice but are only contingently related to it. So, I mean, the internal goods of painting are aesthetic, for example, but some of the external goods uh, might be commercial. And then we've got a scientific approach to understanding tradition as a developed, adaptive form of behavior conferring reproductive advantage. And that's the sort of thing that particularly in evolutionary psychology, people might be interested in the role of uh, tradition, say, in education, <coughs> as having that kind of, um, conferring that sort of advantage. And then there's the philosophical approach to trying to understand tradition philosophical come ethical, as a determinant, seeing tradition as a determinant of identity, action, language, value, and a justification of them. And I'm going to come back to that as well, the justification of them. And then finally, a theological understanding of tradition as an presumed to be authoritative source of divine revelation. Now, um, I want to just quote uh, briefly here from uh, the English, late English Dominican uh, Herbert McCabe, uh, who write, writes about the role of tradition. Um, McCabe is somebody who had an influence on Alistair MacIntyre um, and uh, mutual respect and admiration between them. The word tradition, says McCabe, has a considerable range of meanings. There is, for example, a college in the University of Oxford where on a certain day of the year at a certain feast, the fellows of the college, having finished an excellent dinner, take their wine glasses out into the quadrangle and fling the dregs of their wine at the wall dividing them from an adjacent college shouting some ritual words of abuse. <laughs> if you ask why grown people should behave in this way, you will be told that it's a college tradition. Nobody, it seems, knows or cares when or why it originated. I, I instance this as a case where tradition is a substitute for understanding or argument. So this is, the, this is related perhaps to the kind of traditions that I spoke of earlier on. And he continues, the view of tradition taken by the great English conservative Edmund Burke. So here is McCabe effectively denigrating a certain conception of tradition as being uh, a substitute for understanding or argument and associating that view of tradition with Burke. There are many, he continues, gradations of meaning between this and the sense I shall be recommending. And the sense that he's recommending is related to that of McIntyre's notion of tradition. The sense in which tradition is a matter of identity, so that to have lost touch with tradition in this sense is to be as crippled as an amnesiac who just doesn't remember who he is. Now, the main thing I want to say about this is this is unfair to Burke. Um, so let's remind ourselves uh, what Burke has to say, uh, drawing from uh, reflections on the French Revolution. So Burke tells us, the society is to be looked upon with other reverence other reverence, with special reverence, because it is not a partnership in things subservient only to the gross animal existence of a temporary and perishable nature. It is a partnership in all science, by which he means knowledge, all knowledge, a partnership in all art, a partnership in every virtue and in all perfection. As the ends of such partnership, whoops, sorry, as the ends of such partnership as the ends of such partnership cannot be obtained in many generations, it becomes a partnership not only between those who are living, but between those who are living, those who are dead, 
and those who are yet to be born. Now, there is, I think, as well as poetry in this, there's great profundity in Burke's conception of um, society. And associated with it, though he doesn't, he's not talking about it here, but he does elsewhere in the reflections on the French Revolution, uh, have something to say about tradition. And one of the interesting things that he says is at one point he corrects himself. He's talking about the rights of the ordinary Englishman and wanting to assert these rights and saying why it is that Britain was less prone to, um, to revolution than was France because rights had been upheld and so on. And then he, he begins by saying these rights, you know, long worked out and reasoned and argued for, and then he stops himself. And he says, no, these rights which are the entailments of the common man, um, and by entailment, he's using it as a legal term. It refers to what you might insert into um, a will or legacy and so on to restrict uh, the use of it. So, for example, it's characteristic of landowning families to produce entailments that restrict the possibility of their success of selling off uh, family land. That's what an entailment does. It's a legal measure. And uh, Burke's insight, I think, is that the things that we value most are not the products of articulated theories, but are the products of inherited wisdom. Uh, that are these are what are transmitted down through society, through this partnership. Chesterton, uh, in Orthodoxy, tells us something else about tradition, he said, which is very, rather Burkean. Tradition means giving votes to the most obscure of all classes. It's democracy of the dead. Tradition refuses to submit to the small and arrogant oligarchy of those who merely happen to be walking about. <laughs> <clears throat> All Democrats object to men being qualified by the accident of birth. Tradition objects to them being disqualified by the accident of death. <laughs> this is a <clears throat> characteristically wonderful Chestonian, Chestertonian remark. I doubt that Cheston is a man who could long have survived in the dryness of um, some parts of Texas. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I doubt that Chesterton very often put pen to paper sober. Um, Michael Oakeshott, um, in Political Education, writes, a tradition of behavior is neither fixed nor finished. It has no changeless center to which understanding can anchor itself. There is no sovereign purpose to be perceived or invariable direction to be detected. There is no model to be copied, idea to be realized, or rule to be followed. Some parts of it may change more slowly than others but none is immune from change, everything is temporary. Now, I don't want to agree with Oakeshott about that, but I put him in there as part of a, uh, of, part of a tradition, part of a, of a legacy of thinking, um, broadly speaking, conservative thinking, that recognizes the importance, not so much of traditions, but of tradition as a vehicle or medium for the transmission of thought from one generation to another. Now, let me just pass to what will seem a rather striking um, source, and this is Wittgenstein's remarks on the foundations of mathematics. Wittgenstein asks, could there be arithmetic without agreement on the part of calculators? By the way, by calculators, he doesn't mean things that people held in their hand, right? People doing calculations. Could there be arithmetic? Could there be arithmetic without agreement on the part of calculators? Could there be only one human being that calculated? Are these questions like, say, this one? Can one man alone engage in commerce? It only makes sense to say, and so on, when and so on is understood. So in a context in which you say, you know, it goes like this, da-da-da-da-da, and so on. It only makes sense to say, and so on, when and so on is understood. That's to say, when the other is capable of going on as I am, does go on just as I do. And then he generalizes. The phenomenon of language rests on regularity, on agreement in acting. The agreement of human beings is a presupposition of logic. The phenomenon of agreement and of acting according to a rule are interdependent. The phenomenon of agreement and of acting according to a rule are interdependent. So let's go back to that original question. Could there be arithmetic without agreement on the part of calculators? To which the implied answer is no. And I think that um, what Wittgenstein, uh, in this particular context, he's dealing with mathematics, but I think we can generalize this somewhat and say that the, um, the understanding of fields 
of, of human practices, but let's, for our purposes, think of these practices, uh, let's specify these to the context of educational and scholarly practices, assumes a background of agreement, of inherited agreement, not agreements that have been set out uh, anywhere necessarily in forms of words, but agreements that are part of what is handed on, part of the tradition. And um, I want, I, well, I'm just going to briefly give you a, a theological example, and then I'm going to come back and, and draw this to a close by, by getting to the point, as it were. Uh, the theological example is this. Um, it comes from the Constitution of, on Divine Revelation of the Second Vatican Council, De Verbum, the Word of God. In his goodness and wisdom, God chose to reveal himself and to make to us the hidden purpose of his will, quotation from Ephesians. In his gracious goodness, God has seen to it that what he had revealed for the salvation of all nations would abide perpetually in its full integrity and be handed on to all generations. He commissioned the apostles to preach to all men that gospel which is the source of all saving truth and moral teaching. This commission was faithfully fulfilled by the apostles who won uh, by their oral preaching, by example, by ordinances handed on, who by all of these handed on tradition, handed on what they had received. But in order to keep the gospel forever whole and alive within the church, the apostles left bishops as their successors. I will just pass over the matter of bishops. Uh, handing over their own teaching role to them. This sacred tradition, therefore, and sacred scripture are like a mirror in which the pilgrim church on earth looks at God. This sacred tradition, therefore, and sacred scripture are like a mirror in which the pilgrim church on earth looks at God. Now, this is obviously a highly elevated context, the context of the sacred. But notice again the emphasis on tradition as that which is received, that which is handed on, and so on. Not some a priori philosophical deduction, but something that we would not have had it not been given to us. And I want to just, as it were, in conclusion, uh, use this as a model for, or at least a, an inspiration perhaps, for the idea of uh, reform and renewal uh, in higher education, particularly with regard to higher learning. Now, uh, to make my point as briefly as I can, um, I, my wife is doing this. <laughs> to, <laughs> to make my point as briefly as I may, yeah. <laughs> I'll, yeah, we, we can have a competition of how fast the fingers move here, right. Um, the, uh, some of you may know the uh, writings of John Mortimer featuring the, featuring the uh, lawyer Rumpole of the Bailey. Uh, Rumpole of the Bailey always refers to she who must be obeyed. <laughs> Thank you, Mrs. Rumpel. Um, the, uh, but what I want to say is this. Um, first of all, I think there needs to... Uh, actually, what I'm really going to get to is this. I have a proposal, and the proposal is that we need to engage in a collaborative enterprise that will bring together uh, practitioners of different scholarly disciplines to engage in what I'm going to call a vindicatory genealogy, right? giving an account of our own subjects which in the process of understanding them, uh, justifies them. Now, um, in order to uh, sort of make the case for that, I think I need to draw a distinction between disciplines, um, subjects, and studies. And uh, this is a, a complex matter. Uh, no doubt, to some extent, there's a degree of contingency about what constitute disciplines. But I'm going to say that disciplines are marked by several features. One uh, mark of a discipline is that it has a canon of great works. Uh, a second feature of a discipline is that it has an enduring set of questions. I mean, what's on the list of questions may get modified from time to time, but broadly speaking, it has an identifiable set of questions. It also has an identifiable set of methods for addressing those questions, and it also admits of genius. So those are the characteristics of a discipline. A canon, questions, methods, and the possibility of genius. Subjects are the product of the development and expansion of higher education in the 19th century. Subjects didn't exist before the 19th century. Um, subjects have their place. They are very important. Studies are a product of the 1960s. Uh, studies tend to be aggregations of subjects, and subjects tend to have, standing behind them, patron disciplines. 
Now, um, there's a lot that could be said about all of that, but for these purposes, I'm simply going to assert that the core of higher learning are disciplines. Um, and that part of the difficulty in which higher education finds itself, higher learning finds itself, is that disciplines have been swamped by studies. That fewer and fewer people are actually engaging in the study of disciplines and more and more in the study of studies, if I can put it that way. Uh, disciplines are very hard to make progress in. Uh, they're hard to acquire uh, the methods. They're hard to understand. They are, as I say, uh, hard uh, to make progress in. That's why uh, genius is a characteristic of them, because a genius is precisely somebody who makes some progress in a field uh, that um, uh, is difficult. Um, there are some interesting questions about the subject matter constraints on disciplines, and I'm just going to say that uh, disciplines are marked by being exploring uh, fundamental territories or aspects of human experience the world and reflection upon that, including the study of the world itself. Now, uh, what I think that um, we need to do in higher learning is, as part of this fourth response, the reform and re renewal response, uh, what I think we need to do, as it were, is to recover the authority of disciplines. And uh, part, of the way, part of doing that is to understand that disciplines are essentially, as Wittgenstein characterized, arithmetic. Uh, they are constituted. I mean, they have a subject matter that is independent of our opinion, but best agreement is partly constitutive of the subject matter of a discipline. And best agreement doesn't just mean, as it were, the agreement of the living. It means the inherited agreement uh, of the past. Again, this allows for, you know, uh, corrections, errors in one thing and another and so on. But I think it's very important that people who are going to engage in higher learning and people who are going to train people to engage in higher learning cultivate a kind of awe and respect uh, for the intellectual tradition to which a discipline belongs, which it represents. And so I think it's partly an historical inquiry, but I also think that, and so I mean, it's, it's a history, it, it, it requires people who are historians of their own disciplines, historians of mathematics, historians of classical studies, historians of philosophy, uh, and so on. It requires that. Um, it also requires a kind of philosophical a perspective, an ability to uh, distinguish. I think it was Gibbon, the famous historian, said that he wished that historians had, uh, for the most part, something of the philosopher about them, that they could distinguish between the significant and the insignificant. I could say that I wish that philosophers had something of the historian about them and recognize that philosophical ideas are not a priori. They don't just, as were, sort of spring alive in our heads. They have a history, and understanding their history is part of their legitimation, finally. I think that at the core of Western culture and Western civilization stand four sets of historical uh, events and ideas that give expression uh, as an account of those events, events and processes. Each of these is perhaps contingent. It might not have happened. Two are religious, and two are intellectual in an obvious sense. Uh, the two religious ones are the discovery uh, of monotheism among the Jews, the coming to be of monotheism, raising, I mean, which was no doubt a process rather than an event, but raising the idea of the divine above the many gods, the many powers, the many inhabitants of, the, of nature and so on, to a supreme overarching creative being. The second, obviously, is that of Christianity and the incarnation uh, and, the, and the establishment of a relationship that is no longer tribal, but is universal, uh, the covenant with all mankind. And then the two secular intellectual ideas, broadly speaking, are Roman law and Greek philosophy. In Greek philosophy, something analogous to the Hebrew discovery of monotheism uh, which is the idea of a single truth, that truth at the end of the day, that all truths are compatible, are compatible that are compatible as well. Uh, but secondly, in Roman law, the attempt to try to see beyond local law to universal law. Now, these four ideas, it seems to me, the idea of the transcendent, the idea of the universal transcendent, that the transcendent stands in relation to all humankind, the idea of um, there being one truth, 
Um, it's not all relativist, uh, not all relative and so on, but at some level there is one truth. And the idea uh, that there is one law, these uh, really, I think, are genuinely foundations of Western culture and civilization. And they historically were part of the animating uh, force of the development of the disciplines. Some of them were themselves already disciplines, but the development of those disciplines. And I think that without those foundations, the disciplines fall apart. I think the relationship between the development of the disciplines and those four founding events, processes, and their articulation at the level of thought uh, are non-contingent relationships. That's to say, I think we simply wouldn't have certain forms of intellectual inquiry with certain presuppositions unless something like those ideas were in place. And so I think that there's a tremendous resource in reflecting in this way, in engaging a kind of, in a genealogy of the disciplines that I think, I'm confident, will, um, is vindicatory rather than subversive. And then taking that, as it were, as a challenge to the secular world, and I'm using secular in the popular sense of that, and saying, tell me, how do you found human inquiry? What are your foundations of human inquiry? And I think, and here I sort of return, and finally, uh, to the opening remarks of the first plenary, because I think that, in fact, um, these central values that uh, universities continue, colleges and universities continue to pay lip service to, can actually only be substantiated on the basis of ideas that they are themselves often not actually committed to and indeed sometimes don't even understand. So on that happy note, I conclude. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much for that. I, I'm very sympathetic to the line you're taking, so what I offer is not a, an objection, I think, but just a concern. Um, thinking about your account of disciplines, it seemed to me that the main focus wasn't the whole gamut of academic disciplines, but, but the, those which seemed to be suffering from a sense of justification crisis. So the natural sciences don't seem to suffer from these concerns. Um, I'm thinking of... Bernard Williams' essay, uh, Philosophy is a Humanistic Discipline, where he says you know, one of the defining features of that kind of discipline is you need to know the history. You can't simply, as it were, take for granted you're at the end of a of vindicatory history. But my concern is that if you need to be able to tell the story to sort of arbitrate where we are, where we should go, then might it be not only that disciplines admit of genius, but they require it? that the, so the cost of being able to enter that conversation is so high that there's not really work to be done by those who are highly talented, but at a sort of sub-genius level. Yeah. It was, Ber <laughs> it's a good question. Uh, it's no accident, I think, that it was Bernard Williams who said with characteristic modesty um, that the difficulty uh, in a subject like philosophy was that, well, I'm just going to tell you what he said and then you can draw in your breath and draw... So he said, in history, bad historians don't really get in the way, right? In philosophy, bad philosophers do get in the way because they sow confusion and so on. It's probably worth adding that Bernard Williams' sense of how many philosophers were not bad philosophers <laughs> was very restricted. It probably, <laughs> it probably included himself and possibly four other people. Um, <laughs> now, it has to be said, Bernard Williams was an exceptional talent. Whether he was a genius or not, I mean, we're not, that's not an issue here, right? But he was a brilliant person, without any question. Um, David Solomon, I think, would testify to that. Uh, Bernard's uh, uh, brilliance. Interestingly, of course, to some extent, so I'm, I'm not sort of neglecting the, the point that you make. Yeah, it's difficult. Uh, but that's partly why I was sort of suggesting that maybe it should be a collaborative exercise. Uh, and I think also, given the ramification of fields of inquiry, whether they're subject studies or disciplines. In fact, one of the interesting things, by the way, about subjects and studies, but perhaps particularly studies, is that they, try to, they, they tend to counter the um, fragmentation by bringing things together under some thematic uh, heading. Not always with the rigor that would be required, I think, but that's a, that's a hard thing. 
so I do agree with you that, it, that this is a difficult challenge, and that's partly why I'm suggesting that um, uh, it could be a collaborative task. But I also think that we can, as it were, and this is part of the sort of emphasis of history, not just as it were understanding history as kind of how we got here, but understanding history as it were still being with us. So it's that handing on, right? So this is where I think we can draw on the genius of the past. Right? We can draw, and that's why in a way I was sort of moving around between you know, figures who are very different, um, like Burke and Wittgenstein and so on, uh, each in their own way, I think, a kind of genius. Um, so yes, I think it's a challenging task. Uh, in the case of Williams and philosophy in particular, I think that Williams himself lost confidence to some extent in philosophy. Uh, and it's no accident, I think, that you know, in his later years he became increasingly interested in uh, Nietzsche and increasingly troubled by the thought <laughs> that genealogies would not be indicatory but actually subversive and so his last book which he struggled to complete because he knew he was dying by that point was on truth and truthfulness and precisely to try to show how understanding the history of truth telling or the practice of truth telling could salvage it. Now somebody who thinks that the practice needs salvaging in that way probably has already entered into a phase of pessimism it seems to me but it's a very good question yeah. One of the things that I kept thinking about during your presentation was the way in which tradition, through what it passes on, enables us to ask certain kinds of questions. Assumptions give us language. They give us ways to think about things. And one thing that occurred to me throughout your talk was a conversation I recently heard on public radio with Ruby Sales, the great civil rights leader. And she was talking about how at a certain point in her life, she had turned her back on the black church and on the black folk religion that she was raised with. And there was this moment where she was talking about having her hair done. And at the same moment in the barbershop, there was this young woman who'd been walking the streets, prostitute, who was drugged up who was in all kinds of disrepair, who was just sitting there in the chair next to her. And Ruby Sales said, I didn't know where it came from, but it came upon me to ask a question. Where does it hurt to this woman who was sitting next to her? And that just opened up something in the woman who was sitting next to her. And she said that it was not the Marxist feminist discussions that she had turned to that she'd been working out of for civil rights organizing work at that time. It wasn't that that gave her the language to ask that question. And so that's when she made a turn toward the theological in her thinking. And so thinking about how tradition enables us to ask certain kinds of questions that wouldn't otherwise occur to us. Yes, I think that's very interesting. I mean, one, um, in the 18th century, uh, people became very interested, again, as people had been in the ancient world, in the question of human nature and whether there was something that could be called, you know, that was constant. And so they became uh, very interested in, um, I mean, this is really the origins of, of both psychology and anthropology, but very interested in what were later to be called travelers' tales, you know, tales of what was happening in other parts, you know, what, what did you see there, how did the people behave, and so on. And there's a great um, rediscovery uh, in the 18th century of uh, Roman, uh, of, of the literature of antiquity, but particularly the historical literature of ant antiquity and the descriptions of peoples and one thing and another. And I think that the um, part of what was going on there was, a, was an attempt to try to find the human, as it were, to try to see what the boundaries of the human were, doing it partly by looking to traveler's tales of contemporary peoples elsewhere, partly looking to historical sources. And it was David Hume who was very interested in these things, and of course wrote more than one history himself, uh, who I think introduces, or at least re perhaps reintroduces the, the, in his essay on taste, the idea of the test of time. And uh, I do think that uh, one thing, that the, one of the advantages of invoking tradition in the way that I'm speaking about this, is that it is a test of time. It is. I mean, that what gets handed on to us, you know, I mean, if, for those who like to sort of speak in the language of evolutionary psychology, you could think that there are filters that, you know, 
the, the, the non-advantageous gets eliminated. But well, however, I don't think it's just that. I think it's critical thinking. But I think over the centuries, serious critical thinking tested in practice uh, has actually, um, has the result that we have an inheritance. And um, when one turns to that inheritance in thinking about, say, human questions, I think one's much more um, inclined to see both, as it were, the simplicity, but also the depth questions about the human condition. Whereas, you know, theories can sort of distract by because of their complexity and so on. So I think this, I mean, it's a long-winded way of saying that, yes, I mean, I think that turning to a tradition <coughs> in almost any field of human activity, um, you know, enduring field of human activity or thought on that activity will bring one to ask, in a sense, old questions, to be reminded of the questions that matter as opposed to the questions that were form the headlines or the title of the paper in the, recent, the, recent, uh, the most recent issue of whatever journal it may be. Thank you. And first off, thank you for coming and speaking to us. I immensely enjoyed hearing you speak. Um, second, if I can add a brief framework to the question, section G of this day of day ver verbum yeah. words. Um, <laughs> The mirror imagery reminded me of 1 Corinthians 13 because in the in the class where I come from, every time we meet, we start with 1 Corinthians 13, talking about has, how we speak, how we see as in a mirror dimly. Yeah. And then I immediately sparked over to Moses on Mount Sinai, how he had to be covered by God's hand to be able to see him and live. So that led to the question... Wow. In this case, are the scriptures effectively acting as the hand of God, covering us so that we can still see him and benefit from seeing his glory, but not you know, die because of being overwhelmed by it? That's an extremely uh, interesting question. Yeah, thank you. Very, <laughs> very good. Yeah. Um, I'm just, I'm hesitating because I'm just thinking, do I want to go there? But let me just say one, let me say one thing about this. I mean, there is a, tradition is, is relevant again here because um, there is a question about the relationship of scripture and church. And um, I belong to a tradition that, <laughs> draw your breath, that thinks that the church created the scriptures rather than the scriptures created the church. Now, what I mean by that, of course, is that, of course, there was, in the lifetimes of the apostles, accounts of what Jesus had said. We know from Scripture, and we have it on good authority from Scripture, that he said more than was recorded. And I think the apostolic sources begin a very, I mean, recognizing that fact and recognizing that the canon is formed in the fourth century. Uh, through a process of filtering. Um, not that the scriptures are late in the sense of questions of composition, but the question of settlement of canonical scripture is a complicated process. Some of you may know that the, the process of, of um, canonization <laughs> um, involved try having to show that a particular uh, scriptural source was traceable to an apostle. And so the question of the apostolic foundation of Scripture is extremely important uh, in the church fathers and among the so-called apostolic fathers. So I think that the inter... I don't know why I'm mentioning this is because I think it's extremely important that, the tr that Scripture comes to us from people who were, whose engagement with Jesus was, in the first instance, a personal engagement. And, so, and then with the spirit that is given to us and so on. And so I think what you said is, is very beautiful. I, I don't really know quite what to say about the idea that it's a well, scripture is a protection. I think that, I certainly do think that we have no access to God save through mediation. And that mediation is in one form or another quasi-linguistic, right? Uh, whether it's literally, as it were, recitation of prayer forms that have been inherited, Psalms and so on, whether it's the recitation of scripture, whether it's other things that are not literally linguistic but have that form, I do think that, you know, it's given what we are, God's form of revelation to us has to be through means that are human means. 
And therefore, what we have to try to do in this process is recover. And this is not a question of where the scripture is protecting us from the almighty wind that is God, as it were, like a tent or whatever put up in that way. But rather that the, um, we do have to take very seriously the idea that the scriptures are an embodiment of God's wisdom, but given to us in the only way that we could have them, which is through our own limitations and so on. So I think there is a, a taking account of our limitation that's important in understanding scripture. Um, whether it's protecting us or enabling us might be a question of emphasis. But thank you for a most interesting question. I also want to say thank you, and also to to add a possible critique that I don't fully share, but I think is troubling and a related question. So, how much do academic institutions need to justify themselves? Because the intellectual traditions obviously provoke questions, and there is, I think, deep anxiety about how these things can be you know, <clears throat> justified. But institutions, as long as they have money, seem to keep going in a strange way, whether or not they can give any account of what they're there for. And so the related question, you know, I, I do think ideas drive history in some way. So of course, there is, there's, there's, at some level, institutions need to justify themselves, but how and when? And related, um, you mentioned the, the, the sort of the post-colonial critique, yeah. which is very influential. And yet, the brightest students of Africa and Asia and the Middle East still come mostly to the English-speaking world to study. Yeah. And, so, and that is actually part of what fuels the enormous financial success of the, the Anglo-American University. So what is it that keeps drawing people here when we ourselves don't know what we're doing? <laughs> um, the answer to that is different things, right? Uh, <laughs> Sorry, that's the answer. Um, I mean, I think that some institutions engage in romantic affirmation. I think that appeals to some people. Uh, I think that some engage in kind of endless irony. I think that appeals to some people. Uh, I mean, people who see themselves as bright enough to recognize that it is endless ir irony. I don't know if I can ask Candace whether that's characteristic of students at the University of Chicago. I'm not quite sure. Um, I think pragmatism, I mean, the operation uh, of institutions on a basically pragmatic basis, trying to give, maximize the satisfaction of preferences, trying to give everybody what they want. But look, the justification of, the question of justification arises all over the place and in different ways, all right? So <clears throat> one is the justification of the forming of the curriculum. What gets in, what gets out, what doesn't. There's been an issue um, in a number of, uh, universities, particularly actually Christian universities and colleges, where philosophy historically had a role, particularly true of Catholic uh, colleges and universities, where there would be requirements, in some cases as many as four requirements for every student to take uh, philosophy, but typically two philosophy, two theology, um, where philosophy is losing ground on that score, and indeed theology is losing ground on that score. So some people will say, well, yeah, we're a religious institution, so religious studies will do it. And the religious studies can be of any sort. They can be historical. So if somebody does a project in art history, they've satisfied the religious studies requirement, which is itself a substitute for what was a theology requirement, right? So you can see that's a product of a certain kind of contest. Um, but let me just pick up the, the initial point. So there's many things to be said about that, okay? But let me pick up the original point. The implication of what I was picking up, um, I mean, not through great discernment, what was blindingly obvious in the university's reputation um, conference, which, as I say, is a, now, now to be an annual conference, and associated kind of interest, it just hasn't just arisen from anywhere, is a great fear uh, in the Anglosphere, but not only in that, in, in, in Europe, I mean, in non-English speaking Europe as well. Um, I'm not, don't get me on Brexit. Uh, the, um, a great anxiety that, though, that, that, that the, we're within, as it were, sight of the end of the preeminence of the Anglosphere. Um, the growth of, I mean, if you just look at the, the t Times Higher uh, World University rankings came out, what, two or three weeks ago, something of that sort. Every year now, the... Um, Asiatic universities, not just those, but I mean, any universities, but particularly Chinese universities now, um, Malaysia, Singapore, 
Uh, these are actually just rising all the time and displacing uh, British and American institutions. So it isn't, I mean, I think it's still the case that Oxford University was ranked number one in the world, but that's temporary. That'll be over in 10 years' time. It'll be over in 10 years' time that Princeton will be guaranteed or Harvard will be guaranteed places in the top three or four. That's passing away. So, um, I mean, not that these institutions won't do well, but they're going to have to fight to do well. And they'll fight to stay up there, but other institutions that are in the top 50 will be in the top 100 and then dropping into the top 150 and then the top 200. So I think that the... Um, and the economic model, of course, is very problematic. I, mean, I don't think I want to say any more about that now. It would be very... But so I suppose what I'm beginning by saying is they do need to justify themselves. And they don't have lots of money. And of course, one of the... I mean, some do, of course. But one of the other aspects of that, which, you know... It, who knows what the economics are going to be, but the rates of return on endowments are very low. And you have to reinvest at a certain level to maintain the capital value of the endowment. So actually, unless you have massive endowments, that money doesn't really add up to very much at the end of the day. And most institutions don't have massive endowments. Um, a few, of course, do. The, um, interestingly, if you just... To, to, and because people somehow, you know, I think, have illusions about how this... The University of Notre Dame, to return to David Solomon's institution, has an endowment greater than the University of Cambridge and all the colleges in it. So people think of, you know, these sort of wealthy ancient institutions and so on. The University of Notre Dame, which in these respects has come from nowhere over the last 30 years financially, uh, and indeed in its scale, now has an endowment greater than that of the University of Cambridge, plus all the college endowments and so on. Now, you might say, well, doesn't that look sure that as well things in the US are okay? No, because what it shows is that things are moving very fast. And uh, particularly the move away from the humanities, which are not seen as, as financially as well rewarding for institutions, towards technology and the sorts of subjects that are now proliferating uh, in the Asiatic universities, which are actually developing English language programs and attracting, will be attracting students from the United States. In fact, in certain fields, if you were thinking about your future, you'd do better to go to a Chinese university with an English language program than you would be to go to an American college or university and to learn Chinese.